Hello everyone and welcome to Dimensions of Development. This first chapter is really an overview of some of the things that are going to come up over and over again. Um, so really I'd like you to think about it as, as just sort of dipping your toe into the ocean that is child development. And I'd like to use this opportunity as well to talk about strategies you can use to um, read your book, um, ways to like look for things that are useful and meaningful because the truth is that your book is way too much um, to assimilate in one semester. It's the kind of book you'll keep on hand when you have children or grandchildren or in your classroom. It's one of those go-to books, but I don't expect you to be like memorizing all that stuff. So purpose of this video, introduce you to the dimensions of development, some of the issues at stake, talk about your book and how to read it, and give you your first discussion question. So here we go. And we'll see if I can get this sucker to go forward. Here we go. Okay, so here's your textbook. It looks, it looks unalarming enough, but it has lots of information. So when you open each module, you'll see that I've given you focus areas, which I'd like you to really read and take a peek at. You're also going to get more out of your book if you read with your own personal sense of purpose. So if you are especially interested in you know, if you already have a toddler at home, you already have a purpose. You're like, I don't know why they're doing this thing. Like, can that be explained? <laughs> what do I do when they throw a tantrum in Walmart? What do you do? If you already work with children, you already, this stuff will already come to you more easily. If you're not sure, you, you haven't seen a child in the wild for a while, and you're like, I don't know, I have to do the pee pat, and this is a required class, then I would like to suggest um, a purpose for you, um, um, which is to say, imagining yourself in the field. If you read the blue text here on this particular slide, you'll see that my suggestion would be to think about a career where you'll be working with children or adolescents. Page 22 has a surprising list. Like if you think it's all about teaching, it's much more than that. So you take a look at that list and see if I'm really thinking about working with my dream population um, in the setting that I'd like to be. I'd like to be working, say, with second graders um, as a reading specialist. Say if that's who I want to be, um, then read the chapter as a way to prepare for this question. Like say you're in an interview and the person says to you, what factors are most important when you think of child development? If you can hold a question like that, in your head as you read, like how important is this in terms of the other information I have? What is the most useful to me in my context, in what I want to do? You're going to have a lot more fun reading this book. You're going to get a lot more out of it. So if you get something different out of the chapter because you're looking at it as somebody who wants to um, be a social worker as opposed to somebody who's going into the classroom, by all means, pull out what's best for you. Okay, so here's some just definitions, just straight off the bat, basic stuff. When we talk about child development, it's the study of patterns, really, that we see over and over again. Um, and things that don't fit patterns, because we want to see like what normal patterns of development, physically or emotionally, what, what benchmarks kids t seem to hit and what ages. Um, so it's a, all about patterns and it's all about changes um, in, in children over time. Um, it's not about temporary stuff like, oh, I broke my bone and then I fixed it. Although that broken bone might have changed something um, more long-term, which might be that um, a social development thing where the child <laughs> determines to be a little bit more cautious. But it's about changes over time and changes that stay. It's also about scientific studies of, of children based on a respectable <laughs> and, um, and, oh, what do I want to say? 
non-biased research. There's a lot of crap out there is the point I'm trying to make. And so it's a scientific study. It can be, yes, me as a young mother watching what my, what my two-year-old is doing. But w when you really want to start trusting this stuff is when um, lots of children are in a data sample, um, when lots of children from mixed um, um, backgrounds are in a data sample. Anyway, there's a lot of things to look at in that. And we'll talk about crap research and what you can trust and what you can't as we go. Um, and finally, child development considers um, biological and environmental factors, both nature and nurture, as they interact um, to influence the growth and de development of human beings. Now, the domains of do development, and you'll notice that our book is organized this way, like you'll have a chapter of like physical development in early childhood and cognitive development in early childhood. So it's broken down this way. But that's a little bit disingenuous because all of these domains interact. The physical domain in which you grow taller and your brain develops in certain ways and um, you have in, <laughs> puberty happens to you. <laughs> so there's all these physical changes that occur but they also influence the cognitive domain. And cognition is all of those things that help you think in more sophisticated ways, from concrete um, objects to abstract ideas to the um, acquisition of language and numeracy. So cognition is, is how, how your, you know, your um, sophistication, the ways in the increasing sophistication of the way you can think. Now notice, if your physical brain is not developing um, correctly, that's going to have an influence on cognition. And the interesting thing is cognition also influences the actual physical makeup of the brain. There's some really fascinating stuff that you will learn about this. So these things interplay. If you have a child who is deaf, that child is going to come to cog cognate. It's this child is going to understand the world differently. That child is going to think differently. Um, so all of these interact. And the social and emotional growth. If a child has deficits, if a child is shy, it's going to influence social growth. So all of these impact everything else. Um, but we, carve, we will carve them down into these smaller elements just so we can look at them in isolation before we even put them together. So periods of development in children basically are um, infancy, which is basically right after a child is born until toddlerhood, which is one to two years of age. Now, we're going to go across that part of of uh, child development in this class pretty darn quickly. It would have a whole one week <laughs> for that because you have less control about that as a teacher. Now, you may end up in a neonatal unit or something in which you will work with unit, um, with units, with units of children, <laughs> with um, small children, with infants. Um, but my guess is most of you are going to be working with early childhood. Um, that's years like two to six, just before um, children enter, enter formal schooling and maybe the first year of formal schooling and middle childhood, which is basically grade school. Think about it that way. And adolescence, which is basically middle school, high school. Um, so think about which population really appeals to you. Now, one misconception people often have is that middle childhood is the same as like middle level or middle school. And that is not true. Middle childhood is still very much childhood. Um, it ends at 11 for a reason. Like that's why middle school starts with um, 11 to 12 and goes to about 14 because they are their own thing. That's called early adolescence. And um, that's when a lot of the physical changes happen during puberty and everybody's like getting braces and look awkward just before they fully flower into hot individuals. They will be in high school. But um, just so that your head's up on that, middle childhood is not middle school. These are basically years of age, but they really correspond to what a child is able to know and do. 
um, patterns of, of what children typically do at those age and we'll, ages, and we'll talk about that later. So here's just to stick your toes in the water and think about it. Some of the basic themes and debates that are ongoing in the study of child development is that um, is whether or not we should treat children like little adults. Um, it was very popular hundreds of years ago to think that children were really basically just smaller versions of the adults they would become and all they would do is get larger. And so people would dress them in like <laughs> little princess and prince costumes and like, well, whatever, you know, um, because that's what they were. They were just little people who would become big people. And you notice even today, and that's why I'm using this slide with the girl who looks like she's fashion modeling at the beach. We still have this um, kind of impetus to be like, to push children into things like, like big people roles, like um, maybe before they're ready, that's one of the debates. Um, but that, but the big insight to more recent studies in child development is children are not little adults at all. They actually think quite differently. Um, there's reasoning they can and cannot do. There's surprising things they do that we previously thought they couldn't. So that's going to be part of the fun. And basically our ideas about children have come on this long line of, from, from the puritanical view in which, you know, all of us come into this world, you know, just reeking of original sin. So basically we're kind of bad. And <laughs> so, so the point of civilization and parenting and everything else is to get you to, to sort of surmount your, your sort of original sinny self. John Locke is was basically came up with the idea of like maybe you're not born with original sin you're just just you're neutral you're not good or bad and then Rousseau um, postulated that maybe we are all born really really good and it's just civilization that makes us crazy and 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 nice to each other and 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 fraught with despair and unhappiness so. Now, this whole slide is not to convince you of, of what sort of, um, you know, paradigm you should adopt as you think about that. It's more to help you think of, like, think about your own assumptions. Because what you believe to be the case, like, see, if you think that children pop out of the womb with it, they're sort of, their inclinations are going to be to do all the wrong things you'll probably be a stricter parent or teacher because you're, you're running against this natural inclination to be a terrible person. So it's worth asking where, which ones seem true to you, asking good questions about that because ultimately it informs the way you interact with children. So it's worth knowing. And here's a debate, you, you're, you, this is gonna come up. Um, um, over and over again, but I'm going to introduce you to two metaphors here. Basically, some uh, child development specialists and theorists think about um, child development as a series of stages, and that's the picture on the left-hand side, and that would include um, people like Erickson and Jean Piaget, and they think of like once the child passes this one stage, they are really qualitatively different. They have changed. Um, the child has gone from, um, you know, being needing concrete objects um, that represent something like love to understanding what love is at an abstract level. And for those kinds of stage theorists, those are real big changes. The child goes from qualitatively being one thing to another. Think of this one as another metaphor here would be a child going <laughs> from basically a uh, let's see, a pupa to a butterfly. They really think the ch child changes a lot. Other developmental theorists see this more as a quantitative thing that's just really slow. Like, like you don't, you grow a little every day. You change a little bit. It's, it's, it's incremental. You don't suddenly like, I found myself and I don't have to do that anymore. Thank heavens. <laughs> So their, their view is this, that the stage thing where we go from stage to stage is a little disingenuous. And what really happens is extraordinarily hard to measure, that we just change a little bit over time, and that stuff's hard to see. 
There's also a conversation and a tension between two different terms. One's called critical periods and one is called sensitive periods. Now, critical periods mean if a child is not exposed to the right thing at the right time, they will never be able to do that thing. So if you're not um, exposed to music in the womb, say, you'll never become a musician. Um, critical periods mean that, that um, the stakes are very, very high um, for not doing things right. And because we think of a lot of things as critical pe periods, at least I did when I was reading all of the child development stuff as a new mother, it was making me crazy because I thought everything was a critical period. Like, oh, I don't know if he doesn't roll over by ne next week, maybe things will bode terribly. But instead, child development theorists have, have postulated a better word, which is sensitive periods. That there really are these times when, yes, language is easier to acquire at certain ages and earlier on. A second language is easier to acquire earlier on. So there are these sensitive periods. There's periods of readiness, and those are worth knowing about. And granted, there are critical periods for developing abilities. For instance, if I kept a child in a closet and did not speak to that child, there during their formative first two years, that child will probably remain nonverbal. Now that's an extreme version, uh, an extreme example, and a sad one too. Um, but most, most of these things are more fluid. And so if you look at this in your textbook, you might skim by it. Um, you might think to yourself, you know, what constitutes a critical development period and what is a sensitive period? Because mostly in your classes, in your practices, you're going to be alert to sensitive periods. Like this is a good time to be teaching language, good time to be teaching numeracy, that kind of thing. Um, there's the nature, nurture, tension, which is by the way, ridiculous. If you ever find yourself in a class being asked to argue whether or not we are products of our nature, which is to say our cells and, and our DNA and our heredity and the environment, like our parents and regions where we grew up, that's a disingenuous argument. The best theories in child development are ones that postulate how those two things um, influence each other, that both of those things are ongoing. And to say anything else, I'm sorry, is a little ridiculous. <laughs> Feel free to debate me later. The other one is, and this is where I want you to focus your um, discussion post this week. Um, and by the way, quick side note, for those discussion posts, you post in two places. One in the discussion area, which is a little bubble on the bottom of the module where your peers can respond, you also put that post in a Dropbox, put a copy of it to me um, where I can read it and respond to you personally because I like to butt out of the conversations. I like them to be genuinely yours. I do read them and now and then I'll email you because of something you said because I'll think, wow, that was really insightful or brave or whatever. But mostly I will butt out of those where I will give you feedback is in um, the Dropbox area. So as you're thinking about what you'd like to say about um, this first chapter, this first week, as we introduce ourselves and what we're all about, is I really want you to think about context for development. This is the third part of what I really want you to read closely in this chapter. Because context for development matter. They're the environmental environment um, part of the equation of the nature nurture debate. This is nurture. This is what you come into this world either as a, a deviant original sin to child, which I'm sorry, I don't believe, but <laughs> so maybe you do. Um, but, or you come in with nothing at all, like John Locke would have us believe. But, wh but what are the contexts in which you grew up and how did they shape you? Factors that make a difference are the family structure and parenting. Did you have parents who were very, very strict, had rules, had boundaries? Did you have a curfew? Um, that 
is that is one of those things that sort of teaches you what is like the right ways to be in the world? What about gender? Girls and boys are socialized differently. And I will pick a fight with anyone who says we're not. You're given different opportunities. And why you suddenly, you know, you may blend and blur those a little bit. Gender really does construct much of what we do and what is, what, what's, so, what's acceptable for us to do. Your, your reality is also textured by the culture you grow up in, by the religion, by your peers and friends and their values. All of these things start to shape reality for you. Ethnicity and race are huge. Um, and they have a lot to do with our sense of identity in the world, who are like, who are not like, who we trust, who we don't trust. You can see all that stuff constantly playing itself out on the, na on the, na on the nation stage. And we also are products of our social class, our social economic status. That's what SES means when you hear people say that. Um, and this also crafts, like, our opportunities, we have to participate in things, our sense of who we are. Um, and there's also the historical um, element of uh, co that is a context for development. For instance, I am an Xer slash boomer, which lets you know that I've been around for a while. I have decades of being a cord Cold War kid, of living through the 70s, they kind of texture the, my attitude and, and um, the way I look at things now. So all of those things influence who we are as human beings and the choices we make. And over there on the right side of that slide, all of these things influence your development as a person. Um, it, um, they uh, they um, influence your behaviors, like what's okay, what's not okay. And it and it influences the interpretation of behaviors, right? So if um, my brother decides to dress up in one of my, you know, was at, when he was six, decides to dress up in one of my dresses, does that, is that worth, is that horrifying? <laughs> like, how do we interpret that, that? Do we get really nervous or do we just like, hey, kids are being kids, right? Um, so all of these contexts matter. Um, the beliefs, the traditions, the values, the, the um, the things that are taboo or not taboo. And it also influences the resources you have. Um, you know, I, I might have grown up in the, I kind of knew that we didn't have a lot of money, but my parents cared a lot. So I ended up with stuff like a chemistry set that I never learned how to make, how to use. But based on so many of these things, you have different opportunities. You end up fashioning different attitudes. And even as this slide, um, I want this slide to depict, even the changing nature of the family um, is a really big deal. Um, we have, you know, the nuclear family, which is, you know, um, something that came out of the Cold War era where you had, you know, your two children, your two adults. Um, you had your white picket fence and everything. And, um, you know, you know, definitely um, heterosexual parents, um, and, and, and we changed a lot. And because change is always uncomfortable, there's always going to be a lot of debate surrounding, you know, what is the proper way a sh family should be? Is our families all different and is that fine? So this is another thing that will come up later is, is um, what is a family? And how do we define it? And what makes a healthy functioning family? Okay, so finally, discussion this week. First, state um, the name you'd like to go by in this class, along with your current career goal. Um, what age children would you like to work with and in what cap capacity? Once again, see page 22 if you're like, I really don't know, I'm just taking this class till I figure that out. This, let, that, let this be an opportunity for you to do that. Um, second part of this, and, and uh, I think the more interesting part, is think about the context in which you grow, grew up. Skip back to this part of the slide if you want to. What was your family structure, you know, gender? What did you have available to you because you were a girl or a boy? What pressures did you have? Um, list what you're comfortable talking about. But what I'm really interested in is in your own reflection of 
what those factors were and how you think they've shaped you so far, keeping in mind that you're not done being shaped yet. So with that in mind, I invite you to read the first chapter, um, introduce yourself to each other, discuss the context that you think ha have changed you and in what ways, and I look forward to your thinking this week.